Good evening, Crossroads. How's everyone doing tonight? For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ryan Blau, and I'm the pastor of discipleship here at Crossroads, and it is a total privilege and honor to be able to open God's word with you tonight. And so the series that we have midweek right now is called Spark, and it's all about encounters that people have with Jesus in the Bible that spark something in their lives. And like Pastor Daniel talked about last night, Jesus is the spark that sets our entire lives ablaze. And so tonight we're going to look at an encounter that Jesus had with one of his friends who was actually already dead. His name is Lazarus, and interaction that he had with his sisters and some of his disciples. And so we're going to see what that might mean for us today and tonight. But I'd like to open with a word of prayer. So let's pray. Lord, we are a busy people. We have so much going on in our lives. And so tonight, Lord, we just want to center ourselves on you. We want to let go of the distractions. We want to let go of everything that's been happening in our lives. And we want to focus in on you, Jesus. We want to focus in on your word. And so, Lord, we pray tonight that your Holy Spirit would be here with us. Lord, that you'd fill us with your spirit, that you would speak to us, Lord, through your word. And Lord, that you would transform us, that not only would we receive information and knowledge, but that would sink into our hearts and transform who we are as human beings. Lord, that as we walk out of this place tonight, that we would walk out different than when we came in because we had time with our father and he transformed us. And so, Lord, would your Holy Spirit be here with us tonight? Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. So a few months ago, I had the privilege of going on a mission trip. And for those of you who know me, you're probably really annoyed with how much I talk about our trip to Mexico, because I keep talking about it and talking about it. But I am going to keep talking about it until I've got nothing left to say, because God did a really amazing work in me there. And one of the most uh, spiritual things that we were able to do while we were there, is to pick weeds. Yes, very spiritual, picking weeds. The, the church that we have down there, Foss, our sister church, they have a, a sign with a bunch of weeds out in front of it, and the pastor asked me and my friend Guillermo to go out there and pick all the weeds. And it's really hot. It's like 110 degrees. The work is really hard. The weeds are hard to get out. You actually have to use a pickaxe at times to get the weeds out. And that's another story I'll share with you another time. But we're out there working in the heat. It's hard. We're trying to make things happen. And then all of a sudden, I see the maintenance guy from the church walking out to us. And I am really thankful because I think he's coming out to tap me out. I think he's coming out to take the pickaxe out of my hands and start doing the work for me and say, brother, you've been working hard. Go take a rest. And so I'm looking forward to going and sitting in the shade and drinking some lemonade and catching my breath for a minute. And so he walks up to us and he pulls something out of his pocket and it's a lighter and he holds it in front of me. And I don't really know what's happening. This guy who I don't really know really well is walking up to me. He's holding a lighter in front of me and I kind of look at Guillermo and my first thought, what I say to him is, bro, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> I'm not like that anymore. That's the old me. And he's like, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm talking about. I don't know, actually know what he said because he's speaking Spanish and I don't speak Spanish. But what he did is he said, come down here with me. And he kneels down and he takes the lighter. And you got to remember, they do things a little different in Mexico. And so he takes the lighter and he lights six or seven of the weeds and they're pretty much dead, so they kind of explode in fire. And he's got a shovel. And within 20 minutes, the entire field that would have taken us all day to pick the weeds was completely taken care of. All the weeds were gone. The spark is what changed the game for us. The spark changed our whole day. If I had worked on it on my own all day long, it would have been hot, it would have been sweaty, I would have struggled, it would have taken us the entire day. But because of that spark, 
the entire game changed. And so when we have an experience with Jesus Christ, that is the spark that changes everything. Jesus is the spark, if we let him, that will set a wildfire within us. We go through our lives trying to do the work that only Jesus can do. We try to be better people. We try to pray more. We try to read more. We try to do all of these things. But Jesus is the only one who can do it. And when he sets that spark, everything changes. So if you have your Bibles tonight, let's open up to the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 28. John chapter 11, and if you don't have your Bibles, in the pews right in front of you, there's Bibles in there, pull those out, the Gospel of John, verse 28, open it up on your phone. The Gospel of John's about two-thirds of the way into your Bible, right after Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and it should not be confused with 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John. And can I just say, if you're here tonight and you're having a hard time Finding the Gospel of John, Crossroads loves you. And we are so thankful that you're here. And there's no judgment. We are thankful that you are on your journey with us as a family of faith. Go to your neighbor and have them help you find the Gospel of John. And so what we're going to do is we're going to read all the way through this scripture. And then we're going to go back and start picking it apart. So picking up in verse 28. And when she, this is Martha, one of Jesus' followers, had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, they followed her, saying, Jesus is going to the, she is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench for he's been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, Come forth. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. So let's jump back up. Let's look at the first couple of verses. Verse 28. And when she said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. My friends, Jesus is calling tonight. Will you respond? Jesus is calling every one of us. The mission of our church, everything that we stand for is to simply respond to Jesus. Everything we do in here, every ministry we have, every ounce of energy that we have is so that we will simply respond to Jesus. And so we have to remember that like Jesus was calling for Mary, he is always calling for us. He's always inviting us. And I think Jesus has two invitations for us. He's inviting those of us who've never put our faith and trust in Jesus before to believe in him. 
to put our faith and trust in him, for him to be our savior. And for those of us who already have Jesus, he's continually inviting us to follow him in new ways. He's continually asking us and calling us to try something new with him. And so I kid you not, this happened to me very recently. I had an opportunity to practice patience. And <laughs> it seems like a small thing, a small invitation from the Lord, but I was walking up to a door, and as I was walking up to the door, I felt the Lord say, Ryan, be patient. And so I knocked on the door because it was locked, and within about three seconds, I rang the doorbell. I failed. <laughs> I, I couldn't pass the test but I had two more opportunities later in the day. So the second time I walk up, I hear the Lord again say, Ryan, bro, this time, let's be patient. So I knock on the door. I waited for five seconds. And I don't know if it's just like a twitch in my hand or what happened, but I just went and rang the doorbell and I failed again. Now the third time I walk up, the Lord didn't need to say anything. I knew what I was supposed to do. I knocked on the door and I took three steps back. And I just said, Lord, I'll wait here all day. If that's what I need to do. And he had me wait for like 47 seconds. It felt like an eternity to me. Patience is not, <laughs> patience is not my jam. And so the third time was a charm. But sometimes it's not this big, giant overhaul of our lives. We don't have to change everything. Sometimes Jesus is just inviting us into something small, a little way to follow him. He's calling us into patience, to be patient at the door, to be patient at the stoplight, to be patient with our spouses. So Jesus is calling us like he's calling Mary. Will you believe in me? And then if you truly are following after me, will you die to yourself? Will you deny yourself? In these little moments when you know that Jesus is asking you and calling you to follow him, will you follow him? My friends, there's a difference between believing and following. It seems subtle. I think we answer the first question sometimes very easily, but the second question is a little bit harder. We say, yes, Jesus, I will believe in you. I'll try to be a better person. I'll start going to church more. I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to pray more. And those are all really good things. Those are all steps in the right direction. But what Jesus is inviting us into is a deeper, more intimate, more rigorous relationship with him to follow him. Luke 9, 23 tells us, then he, Jesus, said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Every single day, all day long, Jesus is calling us and inviting us to follow him. And so how does Mary respond? Look at verse 29. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Mary hears the call, and immediately she pops up, and she takes off, and she runs to her master. She runs to her teacher. And so the question for us tonight is, how will we respond to Jesus? If he's calling us to believe in him tonight, Will we stand up out of our pew and run to him when we have the opportunity to receive him? When he calls you to follow him in the simplest of ways, will you obey him? Will you respond? Will you, when you hear his call, quickly rise up like Mary did and run and respond to him? Or will you wait? Or will you even say no? Will we even say no? When he calls us to follow him, we have the opportunity to simply respond to him. And when we do that, what's interesting, as we rise up to quickly chase after him, look at verses 30 and 31. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly, they went out and followed her. So as Mary responds, as she's quick to respond, what happens? The people around her go with her. When we choose to simply respond to Jesus Christ, our friends, our family, our family members, our coworkers, hopefully everyone around us will follow after us. And that is the mission of Jesus Christ. 
that we would go, therefore, and make disciples. And so Jesus is calling us tonight, and we have to decide how will we respond to him. Let's pick up in verse 33. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? And then Jesus, again, groaning him himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And now here is what I believe Jesus is calling us, inviting us into following him with tonight. This is what he wants us to obey. Look at the language here. He groaned in his spirit. He was troubled. He was groaning in himself. And what I think might be one of the most important verses in all of the Bible, and it also happens to be the shortest verse. Jesus wept. Jesus was an emotional being. He didn't hold his feelings back. A friend told me recently that Jesus never held his emotions back, not once. The Bible doesn't say Jesus saw his friends weeping and he felt like weeping, but instead, he took his emotions and he put them in a the little box and then tucked the box deep within his soul so he would never have to deal with it again. Does it say that? No. When Jesus was heartbroken over his dead friend, what did he do? He wept. When he was righteously angry, what did he do? He flipped tables. When he was anxious about the cross, he sweat blood. And when he drew near to Jerusalem and knew the judgment that was coming, he wept again. Here's the thing, you guys. Weeping sparks the wildfire within. Weeping sparks the wildfire within us to cry, to embrace our emotions, to embrace our feelings, and bring them to Jesus and allow him to do something with that, and to bring that to our community, to the people that we trust, and allow them to be with us in our emotions and our feelings, it sparks a wildfire within. And when we truly open our hearts to Jesus and weep with him and allow him to weep with us through the rejection that we faced as a child, weep through the pain that we have in our marriages, weep through whatever makes us feel unlovable or unworthy, to weep through whatever brokenness the life has dealt us. He sparks a wildfire within us, a holy fire that transforms us from the people that we were into the people that he created us to be, saved, whole, complete, equipped, worthy, deserving, on fire for God, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ that he died on the cross for our sins. And we will truly walk in newness of life when we allow ourselves to weep with Jesus. But here's the problem, and it's a big problem. Our culture doesn't let us weep. Our culture tells us it's not okay to cry, especially with men. That if we cry, we're crybabies. That if we cry, we're less men. That if we cry, we're weak it's starting to change a very tiny bit. There's some conversations about vulnerability, but basically from the time that boys are very young up to when they're young men, we are constantly telling them that you cannot cry, which is basically the equivalent of don't have any emotions, don't have any feelings. I even had to apologize to my own son recently because I felt like I was partaking in that and reinforcing that. And I came to him and said, Ryan Jr., I'm so sorry if I've ever called you a crybaby if I've ever said it's not okay to cry, if I've ever said anything like that, Jesus wept, and we can too. And even for you ladies, I think the tide is changing for you. There used to be a, a period of time where for women it was okay to be emotional. If we saw a woman crying, men are supposed to serve them and be there with them. But I feel like the tide is turning, and even now when women cry and are emotional, 
the world kind of looks down on them. Like you couldn't handle the pressure, you couldn't handle the situation or whatever. And rather than serving them, we judge them. And so the world tells us that we cannot weep. But what I want to say tonight is what I believe is that that concept is a lie from Satan that he has placed into our culture so that the people of God would not give their hearts wholly to their one true king. If we are all blocked off from crying and feeling our emotions, we're never going to fully belong to Jesus Christ. And so what I want to tell you guys tonight is that when we cry and when we weep, we are not less men. We are not overly emotional women. When we cry, we are more like Christ. When we weep, we are more like Christ. When we embrace our emotions and combine them with the truth that we find in God's word, we are more like Christ. Now, I'm not talking about hyper-emotionalism. I'm not saying this new agey, get your crystals out, your emotions are going to tell you who you are. The world wants us to focus on our emotions more than we focus on Jesus. What I'm saying is, can we just take our emotions, acknowledge them, and bring them to Jesus? And allow him to be the one who processes with us and heals us. So what sparked all this for me is another Mexico story. Yeah, that's right. Uh, worship in Mexico is different than any place in the world. What happens in Mexico is on the soundboard, they just turn everything up to the top. And when they're playing on the guitar, they're playing as hard as they can. And when they sing, they sing at the top of their lungs. And so it's a very emotional thing. It's a very different thing. And so I was overwhelmed with emotion. I was overwhelmed with God's love. And the last night, we had an opportunity to worship at the church. And so this song comes on. It's called El Echo de Su Voz. And there's a chorus that just says, Mi corazón. My heart, Jesus, my heart. And it quiets down, and we're just singing that chorus over and over and over, and I'm overwhelmed with God's love. And so for the first time in a long time, I hit my knees and worship. And it had been a while. And I lifted my hands, and I started worshiping Jesus. And I'm overwhelmed by his love. And I felt this weird thing happening in my eyes. And I started to weep, and I just let it go. And I ugly, ugly, ugly cried before the Lord. And ever since that time, when I let go and stepped into my emotions, stepped into what Jesus was doing in my life and opened myself to him, I have been more open to Jesus than I ever have in my entire life. And also, yeah, we can clap for that, at the same time, I've been more open to other people than I ever have in my life. Because my heart is softened, people see that, and they come, and they respond. And I believe that Jesus took me through that experience so that we as a congregation, so that our men's ministry can start to learn how to embrace our emotions. Let's look at verse 39. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he's been dead four days. I also want us to look back at verse 32, which we skipped earlier. And it says, then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And you got to love these sisters. When Mary first met Jesus, she says to him, Lord, if you would have just been here, this would have never happened. She meets Jesus with what? Doubt. She doesn't believe that Jesus can do anything. And then Martha, as they're approach approaching the tomb, she says, you're really going to open this thing up? It stinks. He's been dead for four days. Martha, too, meets him with doubt. And so Mary and Martha are facing what seems like an impossible situation, right? Have any of you felt that before, like you're facing an impossible situation? And what do they do 
they default to doubt. And I think as human beings, our default reaction is to doubt. No matter if we're facing something big or we're facing something small, we always push back to doubt. We doubt that God will really provide for us. We doubt that God really, really, really loves us. We doubt that we are worthy of his love. We doubt that we are worthy of the love of other people. And we doubt that he can work out whatever dark situation that we're in, that he can work that situation out for our good. And I think probably for myself and probably for many of us in here, we doubt that if we truly let Jesus Christ into the deepest parts of our souls, into our deepest hurts, we doubt that he can do anything about it. And maybe that's why we have not truly opened ourselves to him. We doubt that Jesus can truly heal our brokenness. We doubt that he can heal the abuse from our past, the rejection, the divorce, the death of a family member, the sickness, the broken relationship with the child, or whatever hurt that has hovered over us for so long, we doubt that Jesus Christ can truly do anything about it. We've bought off on the lie that Mary and Martha accepted that the enemy has told us that your brother Lazarus is dead and there's nothing that anyone could do about it. There's nothing that Jesus can do about it. Whatever the deepest hurts of our hearts are, we don't think that Jesus can do anything about it. Some of us tonight even doubt that Jesus is real. And what I think Jesus wants to say to us tonight is that that's okay. Our God is a big God and he can handle our doubts. He can deal with our struggles. Jesus is saying, it's fine if you have your doubts. It's fine if you have to deal with them for a little while. But I think what Jesus is inviting us to do tonight is to let our doubts die. Let our doubts die. We can have them. We can deal with them. We see them all throughout Scripture, especially in the Psalms. God, will, are you really there? Will you really be with me when my enemy comes against me? Will you be there? When life is hard and throwing things at me and at my family, will you be there for me? We see that all throughout Scripture. And so I'm not saying that we are not to doubt. The question isn't should we or shouldn't we doubt. The question is when we do doubt, what will we do with it? How long will we hold on to it? And I believe what Jesus is calling us into, what Jesus is inviting us into tonight, is to let our doubts die. And so we have to ask ourselves, what doubt is Jesus asking us to put to death tonight? The classic Bible story about this is when Jesus was walking on water and Peter came out to walk on water with him. And he started to see the waves and he started to see the wind and he started to see everything kicking up, distractions. What happened? He started to doubt. And so he started to sink in. And Matthew 14, 31 tells us that immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And so what doubt is in your mind right now that Jesus is asking you to put into the tomb? What doubt tonight is Jesus asking you to let die? For me, one of my biggest doubts, just to be honest with you guys, is that God is really my provider. I've always struggled with that. I'm a hard worker by nature. I'm a provider by nature. I'm a protector by nature. And when I feel like the world is coming against me, my inclination is to push back against the world. If money is short, I'm going to work harder. If the stress is coming on, I'm going to push back. But part of that is because I just don't trust that God's going to provide for me. The last time I taught on a Wednesday night, I had a house story for you guys. That uh, my wife wanted to buy a house, Bethany, and I didn't. 
I wanted to save and I wanted to pay things down and I wanted to do all these things, but we took a step of faith and we went and we searched for things and God totally blessed us and gave us everything that we wanted. Well, we sold that house. <laughs> and the next time that we went and bought a house, I went through the exact same process. I'm praying that I don't need a third one like I did with the door, but <laughs> I'm hoping that this is it. And so in this process, when we went to buy the house again, I came back to, well, why don't we save? Why don't we pay things down? Why don't we straighten things out? What I realized is those were just excuses for my doubt. That was just me putting things off because I doubted that God would provide. And of course, again, what does the Lord do? Totally blesses our socks off again. Gives us everything that we wanted, exactly how we wanted it, exactly where we wanted it. And let's pray <laughs> that I learned my lesson. And I learned through that process that I need to let that doubt die. I need to never again doubt that the one true God is my provider. And so my friends tonight, ask the Lord to search your heart. And whatever doubt that you're struggling with, let's put it to death today. Amen? Let's look at these last few verses together as we close this thing down. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, we, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. And so I want to focus on verse 40 for a second. Martha, like we just talked about, had just doubted Jesus, right? She said, don't open the tomb up. It's going to stink. He's been dead for four days. There's nothing that you can do. And how does Jesus respond to her? He says, didn't I tell you that if you would believe, you will see the glory of God? If you would believe, you would see the glory of God. And so the last thing that I want to say to us tonight is that belief breeds resurrection. Belief breeds resurrection. Tonight, Jesus is speaking those words to us, that if we will open our hearts to him, if we will allow him to work in the deepest parts of who we are, the deepest parts of our souls, and we believe that he can change us, and we believe that he can transform us, we will see the glory of God. We will see the glory of God. Whatever situation that we're facing tonight, whatever we're up against tonight, if we will believe, we will see the glory of God. When we let our doubts die, when we let the lies that the enemy has spoken to us die, and we believe in Jesus Christ, he resurrects his truth in us. He resurrects his truth in us. Our belief in him will breed resurrection. And so when we set all those weeds on fire in Mexico, they died. When they went and opened the tomb that Lazarus was in, what was his condition? He was dead. You see, in order for there to be resurrection, there has to be death. In order for Jesus to resurrect his truth within us, our doubts have to die. The lies of the enemy has to die. Our pain and our hurts from our past has to die, and we have to allow Jesus to resurrect his truth in us. If we will allow Jesus to be the spark, he will burn all of that down, and we will no longer be defined by our brokenness. We will be defined by the one who was broken for us. He will change who we are. The old us will pass away, and the new creation will be risen up. So I want to read just some truths from God's word that he tells us about ourselves. 
that we are worthy, that we are loved unconditionally, that we are forgiven, we are chosen, we can do all things, we are a new creation, we are born again, we are his workmanship, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are more than conquerors. We are a royal priesthood. We are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We are healed. We are children of God. We are heirs with Christ. And my friends, we are redeemed. But in order for Jesus to resurrect all of that truth in us, we have to let our doubts die. We have to let the lies of the enemy die and let his truth be resurrected in us. I think one of the greatest examples of this in the Bible is the Apostle Paul. He was a murderer, a persecutor of Christians, and the number one enemy for the church. And then he had an encounter with Jesus Christ on a road which sparked a change in him and he believed in Jesus Christ and everything changed. By the end of his life, he had planted many churches. He had written two-thirds of the New Testament, and he changed the entire landscape of early Christianity. That's what can happen when we let the old us die and let Jesus resurrect his truth in us. So I don't know about you guys, but I've been on a slow smolder for too long. I've been on a slow burn for too long, giving little itty bitty pieces of my heart to Jesus one piece at a time. And what Jesus wants to do tonight is to spark a wildfire within us, to set our lives on fire. Tonight, our teacher is calling out to us. He wants us to weep with him. He wants all of our hearts He wants all of us. He wants us to let our doubts die, and he wants to resurrect his truth in us. Amen? Let's pray.